Welcome to discussion about governance and guidelines for dam and levee risk analysis. Um, chapter used to be late in the best practices course and based on popular demand, we moved it up to talk about sort of the rules of the game and how this happens um, before all the risk assessment starts. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the objectives and key concepts, the background and history, some terminology and framework, what the guidelines actually are, how that plays in urgency and to give you a quick example. So some of the objectives we have for this particular chapter are to provide a context for the tolerability, tolerability risk concepts, um, define tolerable risk guidelines for dam and safety. And the concepts we'd like you to come away from this are to be able to look at dam, dam and levee risk versus flood risk and know the difference, understand the concepts behind tolerable risk, understand what individual risk and probably failure mean, and understand what societal risk is. So um, there will be a test question on this, so you should be paying attention when we're specifically talk about tolerable, um, tolerable risk and societal risk. So there's some differences between the agencies. Um, so the five agencies that participate in this um, under the umbrella of FEMA, Reclamation of the Corps, TVA, and FDRC um, vary a lot all the way from the core owns and operates stands and acts as a self-regulated owner all the way towards FERC, which um, is a regulator privately owned dam. In the middle, there's a lot of things and not everybody has just one thing. We have some dams that we don't own but regulate and Reclamation has some canals that they don't own but regulate. So it can be a little complicated to figure out governance. So you need to figure out what the roles are of everything before you start a risk assessment because roles play into the objectives of what a risk assessment is supposed to do. So let's talk a little bit about the background and history behind how this came to pass. So um, usually risk concepts came out of incidents. And so um, whether it's the Piper Alpha incident that led the UK health and safety executives to start discussing risk and consequences, whether it's Teton Dam that led the dam industry down that path, or the development of atomic energy worldwide that led down that. Um, a lot of different entities and agencies and governments and um, organizations started developing criteria and concepts behind how we look at risk and how we judge risk. And so there are a lot of references you can go to look at to do this. The lineage you can find in today's best practices and from the guidelines and the governance for each of the federal agencies typically come out of something that's based either out of the atomic energy sector um, some flood things out of the Dutch. Um, and then, honestly, after Teton developed by Reclamation and ultimately the Corps and FERC and TVA, as we all sort of advanced our programs towards um, what you see today in the governance, which I'll talk about later. So let's talk about federal guidance when it comes to risk assessment and risk management. There are two guiding documents, the Federal Guidelines for Dam Safety and the Federal Guidelines for Dam Safety Risk Management. Those two federal documents are available on FEMA's website. Um, the guiding principles behind all of what we do. And then each agency has its own specific guidance that goes along with that. I'm not going to talk about it, um, them in, individually, but you should know that all four agencies have their own individual guidance that kind of stem from the, the overarching federal guidance. And so the deal, detailed guidance could be your regulation, but it's really your governance. And then there are other manuals and standards and methodologies that each of the agencies um, developed to try and um, further describe what happened in the, in the top two documents. So the federal guidelines for dam safety risk management is a really good document to read. It's about, well, I don't want to say 47 pages. Um, it contains the 16 guiding principles behind what all the federal agencies do to manage and assess risk. And so I'm not going to read them to you, but there are 16 of them, but the key five are right here on the slide. And the top one is the most important one, which is whatever we were doing before this, we all changed to to a life safety is paramount principle um, behind how we're doing all of management. And so what you'll see this week are a lot of, a lot of ways um, to calculate and evaluate risks that have to do with life safety. At the same time, each of the agencies has their own legal um, authorities and, and management entities. And so um, it doesn't try and get into how each agency does their own business, but tries to provide a framework for which each agency can use to adapt to their own business processes and their individual legal authorities. Um, so a lot of the stuff you'll see um, that we put into the guidance comes from 
some historical evaluations of failure rates and um, incidents and things like that. And so there's some references over here on the right, and you can find them in the chapter. Um, but really, they all kind of boiled down to trying to get a handle on what the incident rates and what failure rates are for dams worldwide, or if we can categorize those even further. So um, you can see all the way from the 1970s to the 2020s, uh, um, there have been a lot of people who've been trying to get a handle on what the overall failure rate is. And it's honestly remained pretty stable over the last 30 years or so. This is a key concept, though, that went into the formation of some of the original ones, both in the UK and Australia and the United States. They were trying to make sure that dams and levees didn't add significantly to the background risk you would already feel just from all causes. And so the CDC in the United States publishes a mortality rates trend. These have been on the news a lot lately because of COVID, but um, we've been looking at them since the 1990s. And so you can see down at the bottom uh, over here, you'll see that... <coughs> Somewhere between one in a thousand and one in ten thousand is your is the least likely to have a fatality as a ten year old woman, actually ten year old girl. Actually, um, but what we're trying to do is make sure that um, we write guidelines to make sure that we're not significantly adding to the background risk we already feel um, because of whatever happens to a dam or levee. So that's a pretty important concept when it gets um, to how the guidelines are developed. So I'll just preface this with terminology is a minefield. Um, there are a lot of different terms. Every agency, every industry, and every researcher has a different definition for the word for the word risk and all the other words that go along with risk. And so I'm just going to define what we're going to use this week. Um, we're going to continue to use it consistently, but don't be surprised if you're around um, working around the industry, you see uh, different definitions for risk. And just understand that some of them may or may not change the actual definition of what we're doing. But what we talk about risk is the product, the likelihood of something being loaded, the, the probability that the start of adverse structural performance and the magnitude of the resulting consequences. And so then we also are going to talk a little bit about tolerable risk. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more when we get a couple slides into uh, when we look at the triangle that you'll see in a few slides. But really we're trying to determine how, to how tolerable risk is for the whatever facility we're looking at. So we divide the risk into two, two risks, individual risk and societal risk. So individual risk, which sometimes we simplify with probability of failure, and if you're working on a reclamation facility, they actually specifically call it probability of failure rather than individual risk. What we're trying to do is get to what's the likelihood of something bad hap happening to the person who's most exposed. And so we're trying to give is a consistent level of um, protection and, and uh, governance, even though the consequences aren't high. So it doesn't matter if there are a thousand people living downstream, one person living downstream, individual risk is the probability of causing a fatality. Sometimes um, we simplify this by using probability of failure because it's a not a bad act, um, correla correlation to um, individual risk. So societal risk is a little more difficult to describe, but Really, the concept is there are events and, and um, catastrophes that happen that impact society as a whole that have um, more broad effects than um, just having the dam fail. And so society, it turns out, is increasingly adverse of hazards as the scale of consequences increase, meaning as the magnitude of catastrophe increases, their tolerance for that goes down. And so we commonly show this on a, a small FN or a large FN diagram as a guideline of the measure slope. And so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a second. So um, dam and levee risk versus flood risk. So really a lot of things we're gonna talk about this week are associated with the dam and levee risk. We're trying to quantify what's the risk just by the dam itself. Just from poor potential, potential poor performance um, sometimes it's known as incremental risk, but it's really just from the dam or levee breach. There's also something we calculate in the courts and other places that it says, well, even if the dam operates perfectly or if the dam overtops and doesn't breach, um, there's still a risk of flooding. And so we throw that in the category of flood risk. And the tolerability concepts we have are really related to dam and levee risk and not to flood risk. This chart is out of the Federal Risk Management Guidelines. And it talks about all the frame, all the uh, steps we do to go through a risk assessment and how we do risk management. 
And so what we're going to talk about all this week are these two small green boxes and not very much about this little light green box, even though we have to be aware that it exists because that's where the decisions are made. And so um, this building block concept um, is used by all the federal agencies. But there's also some processes. We're not going to talk about those this week, but there's some processes that happen in all the federal agencies, and we agreed on the processes. I'm not going to go through them here, but the reality is best practices that you're doing today can be applied to any of these processes, and that, that was the intent of this training course, is to make sure that it was universally adaptable to all the um, types of analysis to be done by any of the federal agencies. So now we're to the risk triangle where I was talking about tolerability. And so um, there's some fundamental concepts, some things that underpin the tall risk guidelines, and one of them is equity. And equity means we're trying to make consistent decisions no matter where you are in the country, no matter um, what, where you are downstream, that you're going to be treated similarly no matter where you are. So that concept of equity goes through the entire tall risk concept. There's also a concept of efficiency that's really important because it means we're trying to do it in the most efficient way possible. And when I say that, I mean you're trying to reduce risk in the most efficient way possible. Um, so there are really three categories that we're looking at when we talk about tolerability. There's the risks that are unacceptable. And we all, all the federal agencies agree there are such risks that are unacceptable. We've set that limit at one in 10,000 for individual risk for problem failure. And we set that at one in a thousand for societal risk, except for the corner we'll talk about later. There's also a broadly acceptable category, and the federal agency agreed that this is really low hazard dams. And so we're not going to talk about that really much this week, but if you have a low hazard dam, we throw that in the broadly acceptable category. And in the middle, honestly, you're, we're trying to we're trying to balance the value provided by the infrastructure, whether it's hydropower, flood risk management. Um, versus the risk that those pose. And so we're trying to make sure things aren't out of balance. And so that's where we're trying to uh, evaluate the tolerability of the risk. And so that ends up being most of what we do. So let's talk about the guidelines themselves. Um, you'll see these two things being quite similar. So on the left is Reclamation's Public Protection Guidelines for Societal Risk. And you'll see on the right, Corps of Engineers Societal Risk Guidelines. And they're almost identical. Um, I have a few little bit different words, and that's okay. Um, I pay more attention to the similarities, and you'll notice Reclamation has this 10 to the minus fourth guideline over here. Um, this is their probably their failure guideline. And then you notice both agencies have this corner down here where um, we're trying to make tell you that um, if the probabilities are less than one in a million, but the consequences are more than a thousand, we're going to be looking at things a lot more closely than. Um, we might otherwise. But at the same time, we realize that it's really challenging to do risk reduction in there. So we maybe focus more on actions than we are in analysis in, this, in, in those areas. So, um, But ultimately, what we're trying to say is up in this region on, on our uh, course engineers guidelines and in this kind of combined region here on reclamation societal risk guidelines, risks are unacceptable and you need to take action to reduce it. And so um, that's sort of how you interpret it. And then Below it is where you talk about ALAR. That's where you're trying to figure out, are there any more cost-effective ways to reduce risk um, in this area? So we're not the only one with guidelines. Um, it turns out there are a lot of guidelines when people look around the world. On the left is the 2004 ANCOL guidelines. Now they're currently going to revise them and, and do a little bit of change and straighten this out. Um, and this is uh, an old New South Wales guidelines. They've actually changed their guidance, but this is sort of the building block of how um, Reclamation the Corps chose theirs with this bottom right corner, as you can see. So um, they all use them similarly, though. They have similar level limits of tolerability and things like that. And so um, there is some, some um, commonalities between how things work across the world. Um, there's a portraying risk um, section. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there are two ways to portray risk, one's with a cumulative curve and one's with an individual FM points. So on the left, you can see the, in, the total risk posed by the infrastructure. On the right, you can see how this is decomposed in individual failure modes. Um, these aren't exactly the same uh, risk assessments. So typically, this the total risk here, portrayed by the yellow dot, and the point of maximum departure here are really close, close enough um, that we don't see much of a difference in, in most cases. And so 
Um, they tell you different information and different decision makers use different information in different ways. And so um, we end up plotting both of these. Reclamation only ends up plotting a little like that points. Um, but we all essentially use the same information to make um, similar decisions. ALOC is um, a challenge to describe. I think the Australians and the United States and the UK, we're all struggling with how to describe ALOC and use ALOC in our decision making. But ultimately in the core and, and reclamation we've come down to is it's a cost effectiveness is probably the primary item there. What you're trying to figure out is are there reasonable and prudent actions that you can take to reduce risk, even if you're in the range, uh, below the range of tall gear, the limit of tall gear. And sometimes we'll do a really rigorous study. We've done very detailed studies and the Corps of Engineers chose not to take action um, based on the fact that we felt like we would reduce risk as low as reasonable effectiveness. So um, this is pretty challenging and I'd like to say it's a lot more well-defined, but I think every part of the industry is trying to get their hands around how to do this about urgency. So this table is out of the federal management guidelines. Each, each agency, in, federal agency in the United States has taken this and adapted it, um, put a different name on it because of course we can't have, have the same name. But basically we've divided it into categories. We've taken our entire portfolio structures and we divide them into categories and we rank them based on risk and urgency. And so the very high urgency are the really scary dams and the no urgency are the almost no risk dams. And in between, um, you know, it goes up and down depending on, on each agency's preference, but we're trying to make sure that we're consistent with how we categorize these structures between agencies, and so we do spend some time uh, talking amongst ourselves about how we do that. But this is really just so we can focus on the potential action. So we're trying to make sure that for high risk, really high risk dams, we're all sort of headed down the same way and approaching with the same level of urgency. All right. I'm going to give one very brief example because there are a ton of examples you're going to see this week. And so I won't have to cover a lot of this. But you can see that this is a uh, F, little FN chart for a particular structure. And you can see um, each individual failure mode is plotted on here individually. You can see this is the one in a thousand individual uh, societal risk line. This is the one in 10,000 individual risk line. And you can see that there are a lot of structures that there are a lot of failure modes that plot in the unacceptable region, and they sum to this total point, this is one right here. Um, and so in the court's case, we'd end up uh, talking about how we're going to take action to reduce some of these, or we're talking about how we can study these further to see if the risks are really where um, they're plotted. Um, we also plot in the court with and without intervention. Um, but we manage our program with the 